right, I'm glad I got the applause now because there may not be one coming out. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm here to talk about TSC and the kidneys. So um, Petrus has given a fantastic, amazing talk, and I'm now very anxious because one cannot really follow Petrus very well. Um, I know nothing about the kidneys. <laughs> You've already said half the things that were in my talk. I have to spread them out over 50 slides. But, um, so you'll see on the initial slide that um, this is actually a slide I did four years ago, the last talk, um, with Tanya Kara, who did the talk with me. And uh, I wanted to acknowledge Tanya because uh, she is a great um, friend of mine. That's Tanya there, and second to the right. Uh, and unfortunately in our world we, we seem to lose people and Tonya also passed away this year as a paediatric nephrologist up in the Starship who's done lots of work for the TSC group and patients. Um, so I've included some of her slides from last time uh, uh, in tribute to her really and also because she had a great way of explaining things to people, uh, patients as well as uh, doctors. Uh, this little slide, unfortunately it's a bit blurry, um, is when I went to a conference in Windsor uh, three years ago, I think, and there were four of us there who were all uh, either kidney specialists or urologists who had children with TSC, um, which was quite amazing, really. And I do know there are other medical people around with uh, TSC families, but it, uh, yeah, it's quite nice to have um, colleagues who understand the condition as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, TSC and kidneys, but interweave it a little bit about the story with Libby, who she might shake her head now, but she <laughs> has given me permission to say some things. Um, so um, Hannah, fantastic to speak up and talk about your story. It's hard sometimes to talk about your own stories. Um, and like everyone else here, I think I can say I share a lot of those challenges you guys had. Uh, there were lots of things in your story I thought, oh yeah, yeah that's us, that's us, that's us. You know, four months of age, diagnosis, very similar thing. Uh, I think it was 11 different epilepsy medications, it's something over the years. Uh, five I think was the maximum we were on at one point in time. Uh, TSC brain surgery for tuber removal, which thankfully stopped seizures. Um, but left a hole in the head somewhere in there. Uh, uh, and then subsequently Sagers came along and uh, not brain surgery for that, but a shunt put in because of the hydrocephalus and that's the point we got on Everolimus, which has been fantastic. Uh, and then a whole lot of other manifestations. Um, so Libby's had lots of issues. And one of the things she had done when she had her tuba removed and she had a stroke at the same time as her surgery, so it was age two, just to add to her uh, abilities. And I call them abilities because that has opened up an opportunity for Libby uh, in her life with um, para sports. So we have all these problems, but sometimes they open up opportunities as well. So I'll tell you a little bit about her sports along the ways. And this is uh, about... July last year, I think it is, her last training session down, uh, it was actually up at Tafaya uh, in the cold, uh, it wasn't quite raining that night, but she's in a puffy jacket training to do her athletics um, before heading off overseas uh, to compete for New Zealand and there's a lot of long cold nights of training before you go to nice warm countries to compete. Um, so I'll tell you how that went as we go along. Um, so kidneys, uh, people go, oh, I can drink alcohol, that's the liver, not the kidneys. Um, kidneys are our, our washing machines of our body, really, they clean away all the toxins, uh, and most of us have two of them, don't know, unless we do a scan if you've got two, but most of us have got two, and they're high up in our tummies uh, and make urine, which goes down to the bladder, so we all know that part. We can scan them all sorts of different ways. Um, these are just various images of kidneys and what they look like. Forget the little bit with a star on, that's a little kidney tumour and hopefully uh, most people don't have those. But a lot of people have problems with their kidneys. So I talk about TSC stuff, but it's about 16% of the population have some issue with their kidneys, really, really common. And by the age of about 70, 50% of people have the odd cyst in their kidneys. 
Um, but in TSC, you have more problems in your kidneys. Those pictures before, the kidneys, if you like, look quite clean. And then TSC kidneys can look like this. Um, all patchy and blotchy and other things, full of different sorts of tumours, particularly ones called AMLs, which you might have heard about, so angiomyolipomas, which we'll come on to. Um, so a lot of people will come to me as a kidney specialist, and I should put this on the door, really, if you're going to come to see me. It's a yeah, ride with caution, high accident area. I don't trust myself, but some people seem to trust me. Um, you know, so where are your kidneys? We know that, but I've said that. What do they do and how do they work? So kidneys look quite simple. There's blood going in, they filter stuff, blood goes out, and urine goes down to the bladder. But it's a lot more complicated, and we can't just make a new kidney and grow one in a laboratory, very 3D print one, that sort of stuff, which people think we can do these days, because they're really complex inside. So these are things that Tonya made up. The first thing they do is they clean the bl blood, they remove waste from the blood, so they have little filters in the kidney. We've got about a million little filters in each kidney, so there's a lot of stuff, microscopic level. But they clean waste from the blood and put that down to the urine. They also help to make red blood cells. That's made from the red blood cells of what carry oxygen around our body. They're made in the bone marrow, but some, something has to tell the bone marrow to make blood. And that's a little hormone that comes from the kidney called erythropoietin, or EPO. So Lance Armstrong knows lots about that because he, <laughs> he's used it to his advantage, or now probably disadvantage. But anyway, um, so don't get caught. But if you've got kidney problems, it's free, and you're allowed to use it. <laughs> um, it controls how much water we've got in our body. So probably halfway through the talk, if I'm starting to twitch, it's because of the coffee I had before. I had some water in it, and it might need to get rid of, the, rid of it from the body, so um, the kidneys will regulate how much water you store in your body. If you've got too much, you wee. If you haven't got enough, you'll hang on to it and make concentrated urine. Helps with your bone health. So we need vitamin D to help with the calcium in our bones. We get some of that from the sunlight, which converts cholesterol in our skin into vitamin D, and then that goes down to the kidney and gets converted into an active product of vitamin D. So it's very important there. And it controls lots of other things like our salt levels and our potassium levels uh, and various other chemicals in our blood. So, and more, it controls blood pressure. And that's one of the critical things we can treat. Um, so it sends out various hormones to regulate what, blood what your blood pressure is doing. So quite complex, do lots of things, it takes Lots of training to learn to understand these things, and then I tell everyone it's quite simple. So this is Libby, when she'd finished that training, went across to Australia, and on the first step of a, a trip she made last year representing New Zealand in her para-athletics, so she's got the New Zealand shirt on, and showing her form there off the start line, practicing, uh, and I think, what did you come away from Australia with four medals or something? and a couple of New Zealand records, so form was good at the time. That was cool. Uh, so kidneys, before we move on to TSC stuff, what happens if our kidneys don't work? Uh, and that's a lot of what I do is, is deal with people who have dialysis or, or need kidney transplants. So if they don't work, we often think it's a bit disastrous really, but we've got options. If your heart doesn't work, there's not too many options. The odd person gets a heart transplant, but not many. If your lungs don't work, not too many options apart from lung transplant. But with kidneys, we're lucky. We've got lots of different options. We can do dialysis treatment, which is like a cheap artificial kidney. It's not cheap, but it's a, <laughs> it does a cheap job. <laughs> there's different ways of doing dialysis. We can do hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and I'll talk about these in a minute. We can do it at hospital, we can do it at home. We can do transplants from living donors or from people who have passed away, unfortunately. But what's it feel like for a patient if you've got kidney failure? And I'll often say to people, it just feels like you're being poisoned. If you imagine someone was poisoning you, what would it feel like? You feel pretty crappy, right? You feel nauseous. You may be vomiting. You get itchy. You can't think straight. 
Uh, you get a bit drowsy and sleepy during the day and then you can't sleep at night because you're restless. People look pale. Um, they're tired and fatigued. Um, they can get short of breath and swollen ankles and fluid retention. If it's really bad, people can have seizures and have go into coma and bruise easily, get bleeding noses. So a whole raft of things. Each one of them, if you came in with that symptom, no one would say, oh, you've got kidney failure. But you put them all together and it's what we call a uremic syndrome. So they all go together and people gradually start accumulating these symptoms if their kidneys don't work. And if they don't work, then we have to treat people with dialysis. So put your hand up if you need a coffee. Because Cam, uh, Tam has just walked in. Hand them out, Tam. There's more? Oh, crikey. All right. So hemodialysis is, is something that a lot of people are somewhat familiar with. It's probably been on Shortland Street or other TV programs. It's where people sit in a chair, they have needles in their arm through something called a fistula. Blood comes out, goes through a big machine, which has a little filter on the side, which acts like the kidney and siphons off all the bad stuff. And then the blood goes back in the body. So that sounds straightforward, but you have to do that three times a week for five hours at a time. So it's quite time consuming. You don't have to go to hospital. A lot of people can do that at home. It involves needles. And we've learned from Petrus, one of those domains, anxiety came up on there. Uh, and you know, a lot of our patients who don't have tears have needle phobias. They don't like the needles. These are big needles. If you're on that machine three times a week for five hours, it's a bit hard to go away for a holiday. You know? um, but it has an advantage that every time you set it up, the treatment is the same as the one before in terms of its efficiency. So it works well. But it's expensive. And to give an idea, in New Zealand it costs the government, fortunately not you guys, it's free, um, well not you guys, hopefully not needing dialysis, but somewhere between fifty and $80,000 a year. So for the rest of your life, it's a lot of money. Peritoneal dialysis is another way of doing dialysis treatment. And that's where we put bags of fluid into the tummy. So there's a picture up there on the right. You have a catheter stuck permanently in your abdomen. And it looks like that at the bottom. And we drain fluid in. It sits in there for four or five hours, and then we drain it out again. And you do those changes of fluid about four times a day. This sort of dialysis you have to do every day. And you change that fluid four times a day. So that's a lot of work in itself as well. You're not connected to the bags all the time. So people think, oh, it actually takes less time overall. But actually, by the time you add everything up, it's still about 14 or 15 hours of treatment time per week. It's done at home, and it's easy to physically do. All you've got to do is join two tubes together after washing your hands about six times. But it doesn't last forever, this sort. It runs out after a couple of years because we're using the lining of your abdomen as a natural filter. And by the time we put all this fluid in and it bathes in it for all that time, that lining thickens up and doesn't work so well. So it lasts for a few years and then people might have to switch to hemodialysis. Because people do it at home, you need a lot of supplies. These bags... You get about a pallet, you know, a, a, a wooden pallet crate st sort of stuff, full of boxes every month you have to store at home. So a lot of stuff. But you can take that stuff away with you. If you want to go on holiday, you pack a few boxes up, put them in the car and off you go. Less expensive, about 50 grand worth of the year. But every time we put fluid and we worry about infecting the abdomen. So these are big deals really. So we want to try and avoid this stuff. Transplants. That's the goal we want for most people, but not everyone can get a transplant. Live or deceased donors, you don't have to be related to someone to get a transplant from them. It could be anybody. But you've got to take a whole lot more medicines because we worry that the body's going to reject that kidney all the time. It's, not, it's foreign to our bodies, so our body will try and get rid of it all the time. So we have to take a lot of medications. But with the medicines come other problems. We're more likely to get infections and more likely to get cancers. Um, so we have to be very careful about who we select for transplants. And the transplants go down in the groin down here. We leave your native kidneys alone. So that's a little bit about what happens if kidneys fail. So the next step after that journey, 
Uh, and I, I'm super proud of this because I got to go on holiday and accompanying Libby. We went to the World Junior Para Athletics Championships last year and uh, there were four athletes from New Zealand who went and Libby was the New Zealand team captain. Uh, so there she is in the lineup at the uh, Parade of Nations at the start of the tournament with her friend Jack who's super tall and uh, strong and he won the gold medal in the, the uh, shot put, wasn't it, for Jack? Uh, so he was able to hold his flag up the highest of all the nations. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he was very proud of himself for doing that. Uh, so it's, um, yeah, it's cool to be able to go to events like that. So what happens in TSC? So we've heard a little bit from Petrus about things, um, and Corinna will probably talk to us more about some of the science behind things, but we know there are two genes involved in TSC. Uh, TSC1 and TSC2, and they code for these proteins called hamatin and tuberin. Um, and we can either inherit a, an abnormal copy or we can develop a new, a new mutation in one of those genes. And when you get a mutation in one of those genes, you get too much growth of cells in parts of the body. So it might be on the, the skin cells or the brain cells or kidney cells. Uh, and that's where we get these tumours. And the mTOR inhibitors, and we use that, those sort of words a lot, are drugs like sirolimus and everolimus. Um, they can block that process. So um, Petrus has also done a similar slide like this, and this is the one bit of science I put in there. It just shows how complex things are inside the cells. And this is a tiny snippet of thousands of proteins that, that work and interact with each other inside the cells. But the TSC one and two things right in the middle if they don't work properly, that mTOR bit down the bottom is overactive and that stimulates growth of cells. Um, and rapamycin or sirolimus uh, can block that mTOR bit. So, um, but what you can tell, and someone asked before about new treatments around, are there new things? All these other little alphabet soup things on that slide are potential targets for medicines to block or to stimulate to try and interrupt that process going on in the body. And that's what scientists are working on all the time, to see if they can find something new and one little bit that might change those pathways so that we can stop tumours growing or change brain development, that sort of thing. So in the kidney, what happens? There's lots of things that can happen. We get lots of cysts, just individual little isolated cysts. And we could have dozens of them. Um, they generally don't cause too many problems. So that can happen. As I mentioned, cysts are common in everyone else as well. Um, so they're not normally a big deal. We can get something called polycystic kidney disease. So on that TSC2 gene, which is on chromosome 16, I think if I got my numbers right, it's right next door to another gene in the body called the polycystic gene. They, they're literally side by side. And if you get an abnormality crossing both of them, you might get two conditions together, TSC and polycystic kidneys, and we'll talk about polycystic kidneys in a minute. Blood pressure problems, really, really common and really easy to treat, just like everyone else in the community. You can get kidney stones, and some of that might be related to the TSC itself. Some of it might be related to not drinking enough fluid. Some of it might be related to medications that can cause the kidney stones. People always worry about cancer. All through our lives we worry about cancer, especially if we've got funny lumps and bumps everywhere. If you get a new tumour, someone goes, oh, is it cancer? That's the first thing we worry about. Most things are not cancerous as such in terms of uh, TSC, in terms of um, malignant cancers, we call them, that grow um, and spread and go to other parts of the body. That's not to say they don't cause problems from their growth, but they're not cancer as such. And angiomyelopomas, uh, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail. So briefly, polycystic kidneys. So a rare combination in TSC. Maybe 1 or 2% of people have it because there's two genes side by side. And what happens is you get kidneys that are absolutely full of cysts. They look like a whole bunch of grapes. There's some pictures up there. The one on the right, a normal kidney size, and then a polycystic kidney size. And to put it in perspective, um, not quite a rugby ball for those in the room who play rugby, but American football, you know, kidneys that are that big, huge, one on each side. 
So there's no room for anything else in the tummy, so people look a little bit uh, larger in the abdomen if they've got those. Uh, and those cysts just squash the normal kidney tissue so that doesn't work anymore. And sometimes we have to remove them. Um, but we hate removing kidneys for any condition because we lose that function. So that's a problem. Blood pressure, really common. And any kidney condition, controlling blood pressure is really important. So the kidneys are integral in controlling blood pressure. But if you've got damaged kidneys that are being pounded by high blood pressure all day long, the kidneys wear out faster. So everyone who comes in my clinic for whatever kidney condition gets their blood pressure checked. Every student that comes by has to do all the blood pressures in the patients because we can easily treat blood pressure. Lots and lots of different medicines to treat blood pressure. Kidney stones. I mentioned it in there because there are medicines like topiramate, which some people might have been on, and some people might have been on ketogenic diets and things like that, lead to changes in chemicals in the body that promote kidney stones. So we have to be aware of these sorts of things, um, and you get certain pain. Usually not bad to treat, but we don't like doing some of the standard treatment. You might hear of um, ultrasound shock waves to blast up stones. That might damage the kidneys more in TSC or damage um, cysts or AMLs. So we have to be careful. Kidney cancer, yes it does occur in TSC. It is more common than the general population, but it's still a relatively rare finding in TSC. So we have to be aware of it, we've got to be mindful of it. And as part of our um, scans that we do, one of the reasons we do scans is looking for things that aren't behaving normally and are they different from everything else and if it's different from the other tumours then we think hang on what's going on here because the treatment is to remove those. So we get to the track in Switzerland which is where we were in Lucerne or just out of Lucerne, beautiful part of the world um, and they have an um, a, a amazing complex out there um, with a uh, it's actually a paraplegic hospital and a e centre of excellence for all of Europe. If you get a spine injury in Europe, you go to this place just out of Lucerne to get all your rehab and everything else. And they have an athletic track attached to the hospital where part of their rehab is. So that's uh, Libby sprinting around in the 200 metres uh, and uh, head to head with the Japanese woman there, well ahead of the Koreans. Um, but there were, uh, Libby was in a mixed category race. She got fourth in the world for her category, uh, eighth in a mixed combination race, and in 100 metres, 200 metres, and broke New Zealand records for both of them on that day. Uh, so uh, it was pretty cool. <laughs> so here we go. That wasn't scripted, that's like Donald Trump. You get a. You know. <laughs> <laughs> unscripted laugh halfway through. <laughs> um, so angiomyelopomas, these are the, the sort of big thing we deal with in TSC. Um, and angiomyelopomas, so the angio means blood vessels, the myo is smooth muscle cells, um, and lipoma are fat cells. So these are tumours made up of essentially three components. Um, blood vessels, muscle cells, and fat cells. So the fat cells are okay because they tell us that it's angiomyelopoma, and if you don't have fat cells in there, then we worry that it's a cancer. The blood vessel cells are the worry ones, because those are the things that can bleed, but they're also the thing that respond best to the treatment. And the muscle cells are in there, and I don't know how bad they are, they're just there along the ways. <laughs> so angiomyelopomas can grow and can become quite big. So here's a scan here, the top picture, this is an angiomyelopoma, and it's quite dark, this one, it's quite black, which means in this view, in this um, type of image in MRI, that's full of fat. That's the normal kidney over there, it's actually got a little bit of an issue on the side, but normal kidney on that, it looks like the whole kidney's been removed, uh, been taken over by that tumour. <coughs> but if we scroll down a little bit more, it's only that part, and if we look at it front on, it's the top half of the kidney on that side. It's a slightly different MRI, so it turns white. 
But that tumour, which is about seven or eight centimetres in size, is fine, because it's all full of fat. There's actually not a lot of um, blood vessels in it, so it's at low risk of bleeding, even though it's quite big. Um, so AMLs. 80% of people with TSC will get AMLs over their lifetime. All right. More likely to, to grow and things in adulthood, but they start early and lots of kids have them. So probably teenage years they start to grow. Um, we call them benign tumours in terms of they're not cancerous in the traditional sense, but their growth is a problem and their risk of bleeding is a problem. So they're not benign in that sense. They can be really large, they can bleed, but most people aren't going to have any problems from them. Right? And that's, that's a key message, that just because you have things inside doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be a problem. But like everything in life, size matters. <laughs> and it's unlikely to bleed if these are small, less than three centimetres or so. The bigger they are, the more likely to bleed. So how do we look for them? Well, we do various scans, all right? And there's lots of different scans we can do, and they're all visible on these scans. We can do an ultrasound scan, so that's the one you do with pregnant mums. There's n the ultrasound waves don't hurt the body. It's easy to do, it's cheap to do, so New Zealand Health System, that's favoured. Um, but you won't see all the tumours that well with ultrasound, especially if there's not a lot of fat in them. Um, and we can't see very small tumours in ultrasound. We can do CAT scans or CT scans. That's where you lie on a bed and it goes through like a donut shape x-ray machine. So we can do those, they're available. Um, but it does give a good dose of radiation to the body. So that's all right if you're just having one or two scans. But if you're having scans every year, we worry about the amount of radiation people get. Um, good for most tumours, but not so good if you don't have a lot of fat in them. And then MRI is probably the best scan to do. Um, but that's expensive, and it's less available here in New Zealand depending where you live. So I live here in Wellington, and every week we get a report from our radiology department. Our current routine waiting time in the hospital for an MRI scan is nine months. That's when we request something to happen within six weeks. So nine months for the routine ones. So if you think, oh yeah, we should get an MRI and we should get it within a few weeks' time, I know that it's going to be you know, next year. Um, if you need it tomorrow, they'll do it tomorrow. You know, urgent things happen urgently. But all the routine stuff, and that's just a capacity issue with our hospital. So it's hard to get them. Some places it's probably much easier. Um, there's no radiation involved. But these ones you lie on a table again and you go through a, instead of a donut, you go through a tunnel. And so it can be quite claustrophobic. And that can be an issue with some of those neuropsychiatric anxieties some people have. So kids, it's really hard work because you've got to lie still for them. So a lot of kids will need general anaesthetics to have these scans done. But it can help, really help distinguish between different types of tumours. Um, Oh, this is just to show that uh, they did a survey in Sydney that showed that these things were more common uh, as people got older, and as they got older, they got bigger as well. So that sort of stuff I've already said. So if they bleed, what do we do? So here's a tumour here, an angiomyelopoma. You can't quite see the angiomyelopoma. The blood, that got dye that so shows up black on the picture here. That's escaping out of the kidney here. It's bleeding. All right. And what they've done is something called embolisation. So the x-ray doctors stick a tube into the artery in your groin and feed a little tube up through the arteries and find the kidney blood vessel and squirt some dye into that kidney so we can see where all the blood vessels are. And that's how we can see the bleeding here. And if it's bleeding and it's causing a problem, they embolise it. They stick something in the artery so the blood can't get through it anymore. And it might be a little plug of glue or polystyrene or a little metal coil or something that's going to block it. And then you no longer see the blood getting to that part where it was bleeding. But the problem there is we've knocked off half the kidney. So we've lost half that kidney function by doing that procedure. Now that might be important to save someone's life with a massive bleed. But if it's a tiny bleed, we don't want to lose all that kidney function, so we might just sit and wait and see what happens and see if we can get away without doing an embolisation. 
So those are sort of decisions we have to make on the spot if people come into hospital with bleeding. And bleeding will often be uh, a new pain that someone's getting in one side of their abdomen or in their back or blood coming through in the urine. Uh, and if they get a big bleed, they've normally had a little hint of it a few days earlier with some pink urine or a little bit of pain on one side and then a couple of days later they get a sudden big pain. Um, so that's what we have to do if it bleeds. We've said all that. Oh, we can block it with ethanol as well. That's alcohol, so that might be fun. Um, <laughs> so some people have talked about doing this if you've got big tumours. And this is traditionally what we've done in the past. If it's more than four centimetres, lots of blood vessels through it, we would go in and embolise that tumour to reduce the risk of bleeding. And if you go see a urologist, so a, a, a kidney surgeon, that's probably what they'll tell you to do. Because, you know, that's their thinking. A little bit limited, surgeons. Um, <laughs> they don't always read things. Um, but that's what... <laughs> My, my urologists have heard it from me before, don't worry. Um, but it doesn't always absolutely stop the risk of bleeding. Right. And if you do that process, it can be all that dead tissue that you're suddenly not getting blood to can be quite inflammatory. It can make people quite sick. So we have to give people some steroids during that surgery. And not all um, radiologists and urologists understand that. So we have to sort of fight for these things sometimes. They have you given the steroids. So AML bleeding, we try to preserve normal kidney. We could do surgery sometimes, um, and there are better ways of doing surgery now with cutting things out and doing what we call minimally invasive, just chopping the little bit out we need. We don't want to do what we call a total nephrectomy or remove a kidney. That would be disastrous. You end up getting closer to that dialysis stuff. But will they grow? Will they cause trouble? Most of these grow, but very, very slowly. Right. If you get rapid growth, so that might be more than about five millimetres, half a centimetre a year, or it doesn't quite look right, then we're suspicious that this, this isn't just an ordinary AML, might have cancerous elements to it. So we need regular scans of these things. Um, and when do they occur? So this is you know, a broad picture of what happens to sort of the major physical components in TS. So um, a lot of kids are born with little heart tumours, rhabdomyomas. They're born with them, but they disappear. They just sort of dissolve in what we call involute over time as kids get older, but a few adults are left with them. The facial angiofibromas, and most of you will know, they start sort of occurring and start getting prominent by the time kids start going to school, so of five or so. And then every summer they get redder and redder and redder. Um, so they're, they're well established by teenage years. The kidney angiomyolipomas, they can occur in kids, but they're more developing in the teenage years uh, and really become an adult problem for a lot of people, which is why I get involved. Um, fingernail stuff and lamb or lung things tend to happen older, um, late teenage, early adult years. So the treatments that are available now uh, and the recommended things, instead of embolisation, first line stuff, as Pete just mentioned, using mTOR inhibitors. So the common two are sirolimus and everolimus. All right? We all say them different ways. The first studies showing how they work were back in about 2008, so quite a long time ago now, where um, some researchers gave a bunch of people with AMLs some sirolimus and just it wasn't randomised, they said, right, we're going to give you guys this lot, we'll do some scans, see what happens for 12 months or so. And almost all, I think every one of them, the tumours shrank. And then they stopped the medication, they watched them again for another 12 months, and they all came back again, they all grew back, not quite to the size they were before, but they rebounded again. So that showed that, hang on, this stuff really works, it can shrink these tumours. And they gave a few pictures of things, and that one, do I get, is the next one better? Um, yeah, it doesn't quite show on that screen, but the tumour's all shrank. Trust me, <laughs> I'm a doctor. <laughs> There's some other ones that did it, that they did a few other studies around this with serolimus, and people tried to work out, well, how much do you need to give people? Uh, and sometimes quite low doses. 
but there hasn't yet been any good target to know how much we actually have to give an individual. Um, so what we'll do is we'll give a modest dose and we'll often we'll do scans and see how it goes. Um, if things are shrinking, we're giving the right amount. If they're not shrinking, we'll try and give more, but side effects can be a problem. All right. That's another one looking exactly the same. You can see from this trial, these pictures are slightly different sizes, but that tumour up there is a lot bigger than this one. It's six centimetres down to three centimetres, so big improvement for that patient. Then in 2013, the publication came of what we call the EXIST-2 trial. So there, there's been sort of three big trials with the Everolimus ones, um, which Peach has been involved in some of them. Um, the first one uh, looking at SAGAs, or the, the, the brain tumours. The second one looking at AMLs. And then the third one looking at epilepsy, isn't it? So, um, so these were uh, more traditional uh, medical trials where some people are given a sugar pill and some people are given the active pill and they're randomised so you don't know what you're having and everything's done and then we find out the results later after everyone's completed the trial uh, and we need these sorts of trials to get the uh, health people, the ministry type people, to then fund medications because these are the ones that show it really works over a sugar pill. So the EXIST-2 trial they used Everolimus, so that was not Sirolimus, but Everolimus. So this is why Everolimus has become the standard of treatment, because all the proper big clinical trials have used Everolimus. Sirolimus was just people having a look at things. Probably it works. We don't know if it works any worse or better, because no one's compared the two different medications. But Everolimus is the one that's done all the proper trials. So this one, they, they started people off with 10 milligrams, if anyone's on it, that's quite a big dose, and then adjusted it for side effects and saw what happened. Um, and two thirds of the people got the um, active pill and a third got the sugar pill. And what they found was almost half the people had a shrinkage in their tumour by, I think it was about 50% in three months. If you went out to six months, another few percent more got it. So that was a big, and none of the people who got sugar pills had a shrink in their tumour to the standard amount of 50%. Some went down a little bit, and it's an average time about three months. But if you looked at a smaller shrinkage, so only 30% shrinkage, and 80% of people responded. That's huge. And this is sort of the big picture really, which tells you this stuff here is all the patients in the trial and all of these people here had a shrinkage in their tumour. Right? Three of them at the end didn't. They had a growth in their tumour. So it doesn't work for everybody. And I can't tell you, I just can't remember the details, whether these were people who the level was too low or they couldn't tolerate the medication or they came off it or something else happened. But it doesn't work for everybody and that's important. And you can see everyone had a different response. Some people responded only 5 or 10%. Some people responded almost 80% shrinkage in their tumour. So variable, and then the people who got sugar pills, most of them stayed the same on average. A few grew quite a bit, and a few did shrink a little bit because some of them, you know, will change a bit over time, different day of the week. Um, but yeah, so that was really impressive. But with every trial, they look at what are the downsides, and so you look at side effects. And the people on Everolimus had a whole lot of side effects, all right, which any of you have been on these medications know. But none of them were really severe. They were mostly really mild. We're allowed to use that term for side effects. Um, <laughs> so a lot of them were mouth ulcers. Really, really common on these drugs, mouth ulcers. And what they found is people would adjust the dose, lower it down by about half, maybe use kitty's toothpaste instead of adult toothpaste and mouth rinses and things and the ulcers went away and they carried on. And people with TSC, they stay on this drug if all possible. People keep using it. They don't like coming off it. They'll tolerate a few little ulcers and keep going on it. Um, so there were side effects and we have to be mindful of the side effects all the time. So we've now got data from that original trial being published sort of for follow-up up to about four years later now. Um, most of the response is in the three months, 
almost all are response in 12 months, but as Petrus mentioned before, there are some people who continue getting a slow reduction in the size of these tumours years later. And that difference probably depends on what the tumour is made of. The more blood vessels, the quicker the response. The more fat in it, the slower the response. Just because of the way the body grows different types of cells. So up to four years, we've now, we now know that 85% of, of people have had a shrinkage in their tumour. Right. When they followed all those people, 14%, I think that's 16 patients, actually had a growth in their tumour. But nine of them were because the people came off the medication. So really, the growth in tumour are the ones that couldn't tolerate the medicine. None of the people on Everolimus who were still on it had any bleeding from tumours, where there were some in the, in the sugar group in the original trial. So, so it's very successful in that regard. So shrinking the tumours is one thing, but avoiding the bleeding is what we're really after, and it's been successful with that. And almost all patients did have some side effects at some point, but well managed. So they just adjusted things. Oops, am I going the wrong way? Sorry. So that's led to approval for Everolimus treatment in many countries to treat the AMLs. All right. So in America, that was back in 2012, they funded it. Uh, in Europe, later that year, they funded it. Uh, in 2013, Australia approved it and then funded it again a bit later. But in New Zealand, we're a little bit slower. I mean, Pharmac's a wonderful organisation for saving us all money, but it slows down access to drugs sometimes. And that's not always a bad thing, but for us in this situation, we think it's a bad thing. So we have to go through what we call an NPPA process, or named patient pharmaceutical assessment. So we have to apply specifically as an individual from your doctor to Pharmac to get these drugs approved. And that's because they cost an awful lot of money. All right? If you're on Sirolimus, a two milligram tablet, and most people are probably on between two and six milligrams, it's costing about five and a half thousand dollars a year to the government. If you're on Everolimus, probably people are on an average of say five to seven and a half milligrams. If it's just five milligrams once a day, fifty-five thousand dollars a year to the government. If you're on the ten, what a lot of people recommend starting on, you know, eighty thousand dollars a year. And if you're on that for life, it becomes a lot of money, which is why Pharmac sort of go, well, hang on, let's just wait and see a little bit. Can we beat down these pharmaceutical companies on their costs? And it's also why if we apply for Everolimus, Pharmac will come back and say, well, yep, fantastic, it looks like you've got the evidence, how about you use Sirolimus first and try that? And that's purely on a financial thing, because we're just a little wee country. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So in terms of costs, things are very similar. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, there is an application that is in sitting, waiting for a Pharmac committee to review Everolimus for AMLs at the moment. So Everolimus is funded for SEGAs in New Zealand. Um, you just have to tick a box saying surgery is inappropriate, and I think it, that's an automatic tick for everyone. And, um, because if you can avoid surgery, that's, that's a big deal. And it's, it's funded in lots of countries, but not every country. Um, but the more countries it's funded in, the more weight we can have with Pharmac. So back to um, Switzerland. Um, so we've talked about Libby's achievements, but it's, it's great to be a parent when you're in that situation and you can have nice, proud photographs. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, that's just showing we had a good time. <laughs> and an opportunity to fly the New Zealand flag anywhere around the world is always good. And there were lots of New Zealand flags flying. Yeah, which is cool. So, what do we do? What are the recommendations for TSC and kidneys? So, 2012, world consensus guidelines came out and they're being adjusted a bit at the moment, but um, we don't know what that'll quite be just yet. But they're pretty... Um, straightforward. So for kidneys, when you get diagnosed, people should have an MRI of the kidneys right, to assess what's going on at diagnosis. They should be having their blood pressure checked. And we should know what the kidney function is with a blood test. Right. And then the follow-up 
we should do an MRI every one to three years, depending on that person's needs. If you've got problems in the kidney every, every year, if there aren't any or there's tiny tu uh, tumours, you might say, oh, three years will do. Blood pressure and a, and a blood test should be done every year. If you're bleeding, we have to do a, um, an embolisation because that'll save your life if it's a big bleed. But if you have tumours that are large and not bleeding, using everolimus or serolimus uh, is recommended as the first line of treatment. Right. So that's, that's the world guidelines. In New Zealand, we have our own little set of guidelines, which are actually based on those world guidelines, but they're in a nice, pretty um, brochure. I don't know if it's in the pack, is it? Yeah? yeah. Um, with little pictures uh, of what to do uh, at various times, all the various bodily organs. So we say, yep, uh, do an MRI, check your kidney function, blood pressure. So New Zealand got it right, and then exactly the same sort of things um, uh, as the world ones. The ones I like that just came out, and these were published I think about a week ago, is the UK guidelines. So the UK is somewhat similar to New Zealand. They've got a universal health system, the NHS. Everyone whinges about it, but it provides health care for everyone. Um, what I quite like is they're a little bit more pragmatic in their instructions to people. Um, so the MRI at the beginning uh, is recommended, but they also say, look, a CT is okay to do straight up front, all right? um, but not really over a long period of time doing lots of them. So they say it's all right. They also recommend if you need an MRI, do the head and the abdomen at the same time. So people need their head scanned, if you're in the scanner, just do both bits at the same time. <laughs> and that might sound easy, but radiology departments don't like doing it because these scans take quite a long time. I don't know how many of you guys have had MRI scans, but you sit there for about 10 minutes, bang, 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 as the machine's quite loud and noisy. Uh, and then you add on another part of the body, it adds another period of time. And when you've got a nine month waiting list, they just want to churn through everything quickly. But it would make sense to do them together. So I know the Starship have. Uh, do this if, if requested, but you sort of got to make the specific requests. In Wellington, they've accommodated that request as well for us uh, over time. But you do have to, they're not going to say, oh, we're doing the head, do you want us to do the abdomen at the same time? <laughs> that doesn't happen. Um, and then the surveillance bit um, is, is there as well. But they're also recommending that you know, if you don't need a GA, if you do an annual. Um, MRI, if you need a general anaesthetic, a GA, sorry, um, then actually you might want to think a little bit differently about what scans you do. If, based on what the kidneys look like, you're not too worried and you need a general anaesthetic to do an MRI, then perhaps an ultrasound will be okay for a couple of years, just to keep an eye on things and then come back and do an MRI a few years later. So I like that sort of pragmatic thinking they have. They also recommend or note that if you've got metal and other things in your abdomen that may not go so well with a CT scan, then don't do it. So there's a vagal nerve stimulator which some people have for control of things. Um, and then their treatment stuff is the same. So Everolimus, because that's the trendy thing, we all want to be on it. Um, what's the recommendation? So at the moment, if for kidneys, it would be start on a 10 milligram dose. I probably wouldn't do that. I would start on 5 and build it up slowly. Because if you start on 10 and you have problems, then people will say, oh, no, I don't really like it, I won't use it. You want to get in and make sure you're okay first. Um, so that's for adults. Children, there are various um, programs you work out the dosing based on body size and body weight. And there's some quite good guidelines as to how to monitor things and, and in, that are published in the medical literature. But if you're on it, you do need regular blood tests. It's an issue if you've got a needle phobia, and sometimes you might need therapy to get over the needle phobia to do it. Um, and those blood tests, you should do them frequently early on to make sure we're getting things right. So you need to know the dose, the how <coughs> Am I over time? <laughs> Shit, I am. <laughs> oh, there you go. That kept us awake, didn't it? 
So we want some blood tests, we want to look for issues that it might have, because these drugs can cause problems in the kidneys, can cause problems in the liver, um, but we can manage those things, often by reducing the dose down in half, and sometimes we do need to stop the medication as well if there are overwhelming side effects, or if it's not working, and, and maybe there's an alternative way. Um, we don't really know the amount of drug that we need in the body, so we dose people on a certain level, we'll monitor things. I think over time we'll learn that a bit more, but medicine is still catching up with this stuff. Um, there are sort of target ranges, but people below those ranges still do have clinical effects. If you're on these medicines, just have to be careful with your vaccinations. You don't want live vaccines. There are many vaccines you can have, but you can't have live vaccines. This is one of the little things you have to remind your GPs about. And looking for side effects. Um, the side effects could be from the drug, or side effects can happen if you combine that drug with some of your other drugs. And the two things may not work so well together. It might alter the levels of your drugs. Um, even things like grapefruit juice. So that has a particular interaction with some of these medications and the way things work in the liver and it's broken down. So you just have to be a little bit careful at times. So kidney problems, they're common. They're more common in adults than kids, but they do occur in kids. There's lots of good guidelines for us to follow. Blood pressure is common, easy to treat. Growing AMLs are a concern and need to be followed. So just having one scan and things, everything's fine, we'll do it 10 years later, isn't, doesn't cut the mustard really. Treatment with these mTOR inhibitors is now first line recommendations all around the world. We just have a little bit of difficulty accessing them in New Zealand. Um, but we are increasingly getting them and it will come over time. Um, if you're having trouble with them, we can adjust the doses and most people will still tolerate them. All right. um, we may need embolisations at times, but one thing we really want to do is to preserve as much kidney function as we can, so not do too much work on the kidneys themselves with embolisation and um, surgery and things like that because we don't want to lose that kidney function over time. And as Petra says, you just got to have fun and laugh sometimes. <laughs> Thank you very much.